from the TV, it's W. Brett Wilson, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. All right, everybody stand up for a quick moment, please. Pretty gullible crowd. Okay, sit down. That was it. I just wanted to see if you'd do that. I have nothing to say. I have no reason to be up here. I'm just killing time, as Jared said. Be a filler. And I watched my Ruckify partner be a filler, and he actually tried to drop an F-bomb. But fuck it. I'm not going to do that. I will not go there. I'm not even going to step on those toes. Anyway, to confirm, Bruce Linton is truly six minutes away, and he's not stoned. It's just going to be an amazing evening. The pleasure and privilege. I got to know Steve Cody through Bruce Linton. I got to know Bruce Linton through a desire to understand this cannabis space. I know we're going to cover a lot of that ground in a short while. But I want to talk for a moment about Dragon's Den. Now, how many of you have ever seen the show? How many of you watched it for business advice? No, don't fucking do that. If you want business advice, you watch Real Housewives of Vancouver or Toronto. Those girls understand real business. But the Dragons, I gotta tell you, I had took some issue with a few of them. When Kevin and Arlene would say, we're out because you have no sales, come on, startups have no sales. What were they expecting? Or when Kevin and, uh, and again, I love all the dragons, don't get me wrong, I just love poking at them too. But when Kevin and Robert would say, and this was because CBC was measuring the number of offers in the first couple of years of the show. Before I came to the show, my goal on that show was to do deals, and that's why I showed up. But prior to that, CBC was actually tracking the number of times that dragons made offers. How stupid. And the dragons would sometimes make offers saying, I'll give you the money you're looking for. And by the way, the rule in the show, you had to leave with the amount of money you wanted, but you might have to give up more of the business. So someone comes in, they want 200,000 for 10%, whatever. Kevin and Robert would make offers like, I'll give you the $200,000, but I need 51% of the business. How many people came to that show, do you think, wanting to give up control of their business to a prick? wasn't going to happen. And so again, it was a fake offer. It was insincere. It was disingenuous. It wasn't real. I used to poke at Arlene when she'd say, I'll give you air miles in exchange for equity. I've yet to find a bank that will take air miles to pay off my mortgages. Doesn't make sense. So I can heap criticism on some of the theatrics, some of the faux business, some of the stupid commentary. But nobody celebrates Dragon's Den more than I do when it comes to inspiring a nation to celebrate our roots. Remember, it was the original entrepreneurs, the hunters, the trappers, the farmers, the fur traders, and yes, the fishermen, who opened up our great nation. And none of them had a department to turn to for advice. They had to figure it out on their own. Some people say that entrepreneurs are risk takers. I perceive it a little differently. I think entrepreneurs simply view risk differently. A risk taker is someone who goes to Vegas, rolls the dice and says, let's see what happens and gets a bit of an adrenaline rush watching to see what card flips or what dice roll up. Entrepreneurs don't do that. They sometimes are delusional. Don't get me wrong. I understand that. But they believe in themselves. They believe in the product. They believe in the service. They believe in the opportunity that they're bringing to market. And that's the difference between someone who looks at some of the entrepreneurs in this room and goes, what the hell are you thinking? And the entrepreneur who says, I know what the hell I'm thinking. Let's hear it for the entrepreneurs in this world. All right, I've killed six minutes with absolutely nothing said. Let's see if we can do another six minutes. Let's talk for a moment about what I think separates those who choose to study and advance themselves in the world of business and those who don't. I happen to think that there's three classes that everybody should take. Grade three, grade six, grade nine, grade 12, and whether you want to be a welder or a lawyer, a painter or a doctor, these three things will make a difference. 
And what are the three things? One is the study of marketing. So often people approach me and say, I've only got $1,000 to start a business. How do I do it? What should I do? And I always answer, study marketing. Through the study of marketing, you find your point of differentiation. There's lots of elements of the, when I did my own business degree, by far the most valuable course I took was called consumer and buyer behavior. It wasn't accounting, it wasn't finance. I'm an engineer, so the mathematics of accounting and finance don't scare me or bother me, but I got excited. I found passion in the world of marketing. How many of you are active on social media? Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Tinder. Is there only one? The married guy puts up his hand. No, that's not happening. I don't believe that for a moment. But it looks like there's a market for Tinder in Ottawa because nobody's on it. What an incredible opportunity if I was running Tinder. The real point is that social media is the connecting tool. The most important marketing document you will ever prepare is either your resume or your business plan. Those will define who you are and where you are. And the point of differentiation in terms of using the thought that marketing is your point of differentiation is the most important thing you can do. I don't care. Bruce, wave to everyone. There's Bruce Linton. Bruce, keep it down, would you? I'm trying to fill while you are walking in, taking all the attention. Anybody who wants free cannabis, come up to the room after, uh, in front of the room after. Bruce will have samples for the first two. Anyway, the study of marketing is your point of differentiation. Second, the study of entrepreneurship, looking at examples of real life people who've stumbled, fumbled, and moved their way forward. How many of you ever heard of John, John Sotadarius? Very good. For those of you who don't know what Peter Pit is, it's John Sotadarius and his partner. Now, he founded that business with nothing. He was flipping burgers for 400 bucks a week for his uncle, and he got tired of being hammered on. And he said, I think I can find a way to feed university students across North America. And he and his partner founded something called Pita Pit. They built it from scratch, a real world story. You don't need to celebrate the Irvings and the McCains and the Richardsons to understand how great the depth is of real life entrepreneurs. Roll the camera back five years. Where was Bruce Linton? Roll the camera back five years. Where was Steve Cody at Rockify? These are real life stories. And so when I say study entrepreneurship, look at role models, look at people, look at people who've gone before in the world of entrepreneurship. Take inspiration, take advice, look at what they've done right, and of course, look at what they've done wrong. Because those who are genuine will acknowledge their failures and mistakes because if you can't learn from those, you can't learn from anything. Study of marketing, study of entrepreneurship. And the most important thing that I think ties all of it together is the study of strategic philanthropy. How you use your gifting and your skills and your tools to tie together a business I found that with charity, I could out-hustle my competitors because I had relationships with our clients, with my staff, and with the general community that they couldn't touch. And again, I'll defer now to, the, to our MCs and we'll get going with the show. Study of marketing, study of entrepreneurship, study of philanthropy. Go Dragon's Den, go Canada.